Tonight, terrifying scenes in Prague after a mass shooting at a university. People running for their lives and jumping to safety. What we know about the student turned gunman. Two doctors told him he wouldn't live until Christmas, but it was all a mistake. I said, did he just say that I'm not dying? And Cross said, yeah, I'm pretty sure he just said you're not dying. Now he's speaking out so others aren't misdiagnosed. And at issue breaks down a year of political wins and surprises. What impressed me most is Pierre Poilievre. Least impressive, Pierre Poilievre. This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. We begin tonight with shock, grief, and a search for answers in Prague, where at least 14 people were killed in a mass shooting at a university. There were scenes of absolute panic, with students hiding from the shooter high up on the ledge of a building. Now tonight, there are growing memorials in the capital city as police try to determine why the gunman, who is now dead, opened fire. Tanya Fletcher now with the chaos, the investigation, and the lingering questions. A scene of panic, people running through the streets of Prague, a mass shooting at a university in the middle of the city in the middle of the afternoon. Dramatic video appears to show people jumping to safety from an upper balcony. Another image shows students climbing out of classroom windows, hiding precariously on a ledge several stories up. Down below, a man was frantically texting with his daughter, who was inside the building. And I was giving their instruction, like, not to be next to the window, lay down, barricade the door. He describes a stampede as students and staff made their escape, some with hands on their heads, others holding onto the shoulders in front of them, single file. Informací o tom, že... Police say the gunman was a 24-year-old philosophy student at the university with no criminal record. Investigators believe he shot and killed his father in a nearby village before heading to Prague, saying he wanted to take his own life. The young man's own lifeless body was later found on campus. It's not clear whether he was killed by police or himself. The Czech interior minister is calling this shooting an unprecedented and insane act. Officials are working on the theory this shooter was also responsible for the deaths of a man and his baby daughter last week in a forest outside Prague. Police say they have reason to believe this shooting may have been inspired by a similar mass shooting in Russia. At the very least in the Czech Republic, this is an opportunity to look back and say, where could we as a society have intervened earlier? This expert says access to firearms is only one piece of the puzzle. But we know that if individuals who are motivated to do harm will find other means to do that. And so thinking about what is it from a social context that actually contributes to the, to the outcome and Tanya, a word tonight that this horrific tragedy could have been even worse. Well, that's right, Asher. Police tonight saying they discovered a huge arsenal of weapons at the university and that the number of victims would have been many times greater had officers not moved in when they did. Now, this kind of attack does seem to be rare in Europe, even though many people do own guns there. The Czech Republic itself, for example, has more than one million registered weapons in a country of just 10 million people. Its gun laws are relatively liberal, but they do have measures like mandatory safety courses, for example, to get a gun license. And in this case, we know the shooter was a legal holder of firearms. Asha? All right. Tanya, thank you. You bet. Ottawa has announced new immigration measures to get more people with connections to Canada out of the Gaza Strip. It comes as the UN warns that more than 500,000 people in the territory are starving. That's one in four Gazans in catastrophic hunger. After more than 10 weeks, much of that completely cut off from food and other supplies, war is raising the specter of famine. And even as starvation spreads, Israel's bombs are still falling. A UN Security Council vote on a resolution for more aid and humanitarian pauses has again been pushed back another day. And as Sasha Petrasik shows us, the need for relief has become even more urgent. In a Gaza soup line, the cries for food are getting louder. A quarter of Gaza's population is already starving, more here than in the rest of the world combined, says the World Food Programme. 
like Tahani Nasser's family, they haven't found food in days. She says her children have lost half their weight since the war started. And the UN says it could get far worse. If the war continues the way it is, if the assistance is not coming in the way it should, we will be looking at a famine in the next six months. With Israel screening and limiting aid at the borders, and with it impossible to widely distribute amid the fighting, everything is in short supply, including emergency care. In the north of Gaza, it's now only available in this church, where patients lie on pews. They don't have specialists, they don't have surgeons, uh, they don't have power, they don't have water, uh, they don't have food. A little joy is flowing into a corner of southern Rafa, fresh water. Pumped from three treatment plants built across the border in Egypt by the United Arab Emirates. But with both Israel and Hamas vowing to fight to the end, relentless Israeli airstrikes in Gaza, and Hamas rockets intercepted over Tel Aviv, no one expects aid shortages to end soon. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Ottawa, citing the devastating humanitarian crisis in Gaza, is introducing new rules that make extended family members of Canadians eligible to escape. And as Rafi Bujakanian shows us, for some, it can't come soon enough. Please, God protect you. The last text message Isra al Safin got from her brother was a heart emoji. I'm like, make sure it's safe, make sure there's nothing else happening, because we know airstrikes going to happen anywhere. And he's like, don't worry, we'll be good. But she says Ahmed al Safin was killed in an airstrike while attempting to flee northern Gaza. His wife and infant son made it to the south, where they joined al Safin's parents. I want them to be safe. I want them to settle down. Now, Ottawa has announced a lifeline to extended families of Canadians or permanent residents like the al Safins, allowing them to temporarily come here. We understand uh, that many are concerned about the safety of loved ones currently residing in Gaza. Today is about providing a humanitarian pathway. But even some Canadian citizens who are already eligible are having trouble getting out of Gaza. Mahmoud Kuta counts his blessings as he survives day by day in this refugee camp. When I go to find water, when I go to find food, I, I tell my wife goodbye. I kiss my daughter and I hope it's not the last kiss that I give to her. I called the Embassy of Canada and told them why is my name on the list and they kept on answering me with the same answer, we have no update and we can't answer you. The immigration minister admits it's not entirely Canada's decision. The Israelis have their say. They will screen people and, 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 and decide whether they leave or don't leave. We don't have any assurances as of yet. For Al Safin, an agonizing wait for clarity. The news of my brother's um, uh, death, it's hard. Just thinking about that's going to happen again to one of them, I can't bear think of it. But she also managed to meet with the immigration minister, who told her his department is putting the finishing touches on how to apply for these special measures, giving her some hope she'll see her family here safely soon. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Air Canada is facing a fine of nearly $100,000 for failing to help a passenger using a wheelchair disembark from a plane. The penalty is tied to a flight in August. That's when, after landing in Las Vegas, Rodney Hodgins, who has spastic cerebral palsy, says he was forced to drag himself off the plane, on the floor, and on his own. The Canadian Transportation Agency launched an investigation after CBC News first reported the incident. Air Canada has since apologized, though it still has 30 days to appeal the ruling. A Winnipeg man is speaking out after a fatal diagnosis turned out to be a mistake. He was told he wouldn't live to see Christmas, but then found out that was wrong. As Brittany Greenslade shows us, he's hoping other families won't endure the same pain he did. This is Frederick Bergstrom's favorite time of year, but this year 
he wasn't sure he would still be alive to celebrate it. I had no plans of being here this Christmas. So this Christmas is a blessing. In March, Bergstrom developed a sudden limp and numbness in his foot. He saw his family doctor. He did a 10-minute examination, and then he literally teared up and hugged me. And he said, Frederick, this is ALS. Three days later, he got a second opinion. He uses words such as catastrophical neurological breakdown, rapid progression, ALS. So now not only am I dying, I'm, I'm dying in the fast lane. ALS is a disease that progressively paralyzes people. There is no cure. He was told his was moving quickly. The numbness spread to his other foot. Rapidly worsening and very grim prognosis. His father and younger brother both died from it. Now he had to tell his family he was dying too. It was scary. It was really scary. We're like, what's going to happen to our, our life, our world? Told he had just months to live, he shut down his business, planned his funeral. 2023 was just a summer of, of crying. But everything changed in late July when he was referred to a neurologist who told him he'd been misdiagnosed. I said, did he just say that I'm not dying? Bergstrom does not have ALS. He suffers from neuropathy or nerve damage from his diabetes. And he's not the only one who's been misdiagnosed. The ALS Association says roughly 15% of initial diagnoses are incorrect. It's why the doctor of the largest ALS clinic in Canada says ALS should only be diagnosed by a specialist, not a family doctor. And until you see do all the MRIs, EMGs, and exclude other possibilities, it's very hard to give that diagnosis. Bergstrom says he does not wish to pursue legal action against the family doctors. His primary concern is making sure it's a mistake that doesn't happen again. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. The west coast of Newfoundland is getting blasted by a powerful winter storm. Some areas could see anywhere from 20 to 45 centimetres, and wind gusts are expected to reach 80 kilometres an hour. Environment Canada says the messy weather could continue into Friday, while in New Brunswick, they're still cleaning up after a storm earlier this week. We know that being without power for an extended period of time is very difficult, especially as we approach the holidays. More than 20,000 customers were still without power in that province as of Thursday afternoon. This will be a fourth night without electricity for many. On Monday, a storm packing winds of up to 100 kilometers an hour ripped through the province. Officials say they're aiming to have everyone's power restored by Christmas. A court in the Netherlands has ruled the man convicted of sexually extorting, Amanda Todd, will serve six more years in prison. The BC teen died by suicide after posting a video watched around the world detailing years of online abuse. Lindsay Duncombe starts with reaction from Todd's mother. After 10 years of judicial hearings on two continents, punishment for the man who tormented Carol Todd's daughter. Six years. Six years is... I'm okay with that. Hopefully it sends a message to other offenders that um, you can be caught. 15-year-old Amanda Todd killed herself shortly after posting this video, detailing how for years an online predator forced her to take sexual images and shared them widely. That predator was Dutch, Aidan Coban, then in his 30s. A court in the Netherlands has since sentenced him to 11 years in prison for exploiting 33 others. But Todd's case was separated. Coban was extradited to face trial in British Columbia, where he was sentenced to 13 years. The sentence had to be converted to the Dutch legal system, where Coban will serve his time. Advocates were surprised that court imposed the maximum it could for the crimes in that country, six years, to be served after his current sentence is complete. I think that there was a risk that there would be no additional time imposed in the Netherlands, so the fact that there is some time is a positive development. Coban is expected to appeal to the Dutch Supreme Court. The international legal cooperation comes as more and more children face sextortion, often by criminal networks seeking cash. When you give a message to potential perpetrators, uh, if you take the risk of causing uh, 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 casualties elsewhere in, in the globe, there's also a chance that you will be sent to that country. 
People who study international law see this prosecution as a success, possible because Canada and the Netherlands share treaties. Authorities trust each other. Finding and convicting predators in less cooperative countries is far more difficult. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. The federal government is promising Canada's biggest city nearly a half billion dollars to build more housing faster. We told municipalities they could access these funds with bold plans to eliminate red tape and remove barriers. And that's exactly what this, this agreement today with Toronto does. The $471 million is expected to result in 12,000 new homes over the next three years and 50,000 over the next decade. This is the latest in a series of deals made with municipalities that the feds say will result in 380,000 new units across Canada. Still in Toronto, several asylum seekers who have relied on temporary shelters could soon have nowhere to go. Philip Lee Shannick now with the pressures on those who are trying to help. Then we have the different offices. It started in a small church in a strip mall and spread to a bank, restaurant and offices above. By word of mouth, asylum seekers found their way here to get a hot meal, some winter clothes and a place to rest. For some reason, when they say they don't have anywhere to go, some of the cab drivers know who, where we are and they're actually bringing them. Uh, to us. The church opened its doors in the summer after city shelters began turning away refugee claimants who ended up on the street. It was supposed to be a temporary fix. We knew it wasn't sustainable, don't get me wrong, um, but we thought we were going to be getting some type of help. Now they're out of money, in debt, and say they have to shut down in a week, leaving those who rely on the shelter facing an uncertain future. Actually, I don't really have nowhere to go. Now they're spreading the word that asylum seekers should look elsewhere. It says closed for new intake, but while we're here, a family of four arrived and they weren't turned away. But that may change soon. Without further funding, organizers say they'll have to close for good just after Christmas. It's not just Toronto facing an increased need, with more than 128,000 asylum seekers entering Canada so far this year. That number substantially higher than the previous year, nearly 92,000. While not all asylum seekers need help finding shelter, the NDP leader says the situation is dire and the federal government needs to step in. They're not shelters, but churches have stepped up and provided places for people and they've stretched themselves and their budgets to the limit. Organizers would like to keep their doors open. I'm hoping for a miracle. They're scrambling to get as many into the federal refugee system as possible, or they will have no recourse but the city shelter system, which is already turning people away. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. A new mall has opened in Toronto, hoping to attract shoppers. Simply having a, a Gap store and uh, a food court isn't going to cut it anymore. How malls are changing to get you walking through. A cruise to the Bahamas arrives in New Brunswick instead. Well, I was a little bummed up. Regardless, you know what? We're on vacation, so we are happy. And... Hey, you can't park there! A moment to remember at an Ontario hotel. Ask about our valley parking. We're back in two. For passengers on the cruise ship Maravilla, St. John, New Brunswick wasn't originally on the itinerary. I wanted to see some nice warm weather. Nothing I got, I haven't got nothing against St. John, but. <laughs> but a fierce Caribbean storm meant a last second change in plans. The ship was rerouted from Florida and the Bahamas to New England and New Brunswick. I was quite disturbed. Um, we're not at the Bahamas, we're happy we're here though. It's cold but it's okay, we are happy to be there. So from friends, hello and a Merry Christmas to everybody. After getting used to the chill, passengers decided to roll with it and hit the town. Well, we're just going to use the, the, the good old map, old-fashioned way, and just like from? do our little shopping. To, to do shopping. There's shopping, <laughs> beautiful scenery And to we see. want to, to eat lobster also. I've always wanted to go to Canada. That's the spirit. 
Many Canadians are also likely doing some last-minute holiday shopping as malls compete to bring in those shoppers. There's a new concept aimed at attracting crowds. Jamie Strachan explains. Canada has never seen a shopping mall like this. Surrounded by condos in the heart of Toronto's downtown, no doors, no ceilings, no sprawling parking lots. I just think it's a beautiful building and it's stunning architecture. I love walking around. It feels like you're still outside but shopping at the same time, so it's a nice way to spend the day. While many traditional malls are struggling, there are successful attempts to revitalize and reinvent. The well is a space where often the retail offerings are an afterthought. We have a lot of uh, active, uh, you know, I would say, experiential uses here where you can come and, and, and not just uh, go into a store and leave, but rather come into a place and experience it for a number of hours. Well, the first thing that caught my eye was really just the idea that someone was opening a new mall in 2023. Alexandra Lang has written extensively about North American malls and says the Wells retail approach is unique. The focus is really not on fashion retail or big brands, with the, but it's on the kind of shops that you want to have in your neighborhood. And I just think that is a really interesting kind of tweak to the mall formula um, to take it away from retail and to back towards more of these services. Toronto's Yorkdale Mall is doing more business than ever, drawing visitors with a large collection of luxury brands and offering unique experiences like the Dior Christmas tree. If there's an event, it's more exciting and you're more enticed to buy because you're here and, you know, someone's really gone out to reach out to you. Also, despite many predictions that online shopping would kill in-person retail, data shows that hasn't been the case. So when you're online, you don't know if you're getting what you think you're getting. At the same time, more than 80% of Canadians are Amazon shoppers, meaning malls have to offer more than a traditional shopping experience. Simply having a, a Gap store and a food court isn't going to cut it anymore. There has to be something more, more entertaining, uh, more compelling to drive young people to those experiences. But they are indeed hungry for those physical experiences. Hungry to get out and do more than simply shop. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. After a tumultuous year, the House of Commons has risen for the winter break. Uh, cranky. Rosie and the Ad Issue panel tell us how they really feel about this political year. But first, chaos at the polls. Some places where people voted um, until past midnight. Why this election is crucial to the EV revolution. The National breaks down the story shaping our world next. Rudy Giuliani has filed for bankruptcy in New York. This comes after the former Donald Trump attorney was ordered to pay $148 million for defaming two Georgia election workers. He had falsely accused the women of fraud as he tried to overturn Trump's 2020 election laws. In today's filing, Giuliani has listed debts of nearly $153 million. After a chaotic first day of voting in the Democratic Republic of Congo, many were forced to return to the polls today in an effort to select their next president. Ithil Musa now with why this result could be critical for the region and beyond. In eastern Congo, people waited yet again to vote in the country's general election. I've been here since yesterday morning, says Alfred Bahadi. I spent the night here trying to find a way into the polling station, but it didn't work. Voting was unexpectedly extended into a second day after delays in the delivery of supplies, malfunctioning equipment and reports of violence at some polls. It's total chaos. There's no organization, says presidential candidate and opposition leader Martin Fayulu. The election comes at a time when millions are displaced in Congo as armed groups fight for power and resources. I would say security and, and uh, fair distribution of, of national revenue will be probably one of the uh, uh, key uh, issues of this election. Congo is the world's third largest copper producer and the top producer of cobalt, a key component in rechargeable batteries for electric vehicles and a key resource for countries like Canada. We have a comprehensive plan to build a robust electric vehicle supply chain and supporting infrastructure. 
Canada plans to phase out sales of gas-powered cars and trucks by 2035, which could drive demand for cobalt. But it's multinational corporations and the political elite who are benefiting from Congo's booming mining industry, says this expert. Most of that money doesn't stay in, uh, in the country. Congolese people are not at the center of, of uh, the way uh, resources are being distributed. The incumbent in this race, Felix Shizuketi, appears to be the front runner again. He's vowing to create more jobs and tackle the insecurity that has racked the eastern part of the country for three decades. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's break down the news shaping our world. It's Thursday, so Rosie's here with a special year-end at issue. At issue this week, the political year in review. Affordability dominated much of 2023. We are focused on affordability for Canadians. They're focused on picking fights. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, everything costs more. The Conservatives gained a lead in the polls and the Liberals announced a carbon tax exemption. There were also election wins, allegations of foreign interference, high profile visits and resignations. All this as wars fueled global instability and division. So what were the political highs and lows of the year? I'm Rosemary Barton here to break it down in person, all together in Toronto, Chantal Bear. Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. Look at this. It's like old times, isn't it? It's wonderful to see you all in person. Okay, so this is, um, this is the one I like the most because I get your quick takes on things, important things. I'm going to start with one word to describe the year in politics and why, and you're up first, John. Uh, cranky. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen That's as... us or... <laughs> cranky and cranky. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a year where it was so tough to be an incumbent. Uh, and I don't just mean uh, federally. Yeah. It's true in the provinces, but it's true across the world. Look, Joe Biden, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, in the UK, the next election will probably bring change. And some of the change elections that we saw were, were change elections. Mm -hmm. They weren't about right or left mm -hmm. uh, or extreme right or uh, Poland went in one direction, yeah. etc. Uh, and the Netherlands in another. It's just people are angry and they're taking it out on incumbents. Okay, Andrew, your word. Uh, disintegration. Mm. Uh, so far, uh, this is very positive. <laughs> <laughs> so at home, we've had you know premiers running off, you know, rewriting the constitution unilaterally, vowing they're going to disobey the law. Uh, running roughshod over the charter internationally, you've got a you know this ongoing accelerating it looks like breakdown in the international rules-based order, so disarray and disintegration there as well, uh, including on the economy where we're seeing the first signs of unraveling of the of the international globalized economy. And I think we should be very worried about that. And then it, it more sort of atmospherically a breakdown in consensus on issues that we thought we had a fair degree of un unanimity. We're starting to see this on immigration, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, at the farthest extreme, uh, this accelerating breakdown in the in the you know fact-based society, the ability of democratic societies, not just in Canada but everywhere, mm. uh, to actually argue from the same set of facts. Althea, I said partisan for all the reasons that both <coughs> Rafael and Andrew have laid out. I think political parties have decided not to focus on the stuff that unites them, not that they usually do, but they have taken it to a different level. Mm. And it's hyper-partisan. Everything has been politicized. Um, and you told me not to talk too much, so I'm going to end it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we can get through uh, this I'm list. Sure, yeah, I'm, <laughs> sure, <laughs> I'm sure she's going to catch up later. I can see money the in the biggest, bank. The biggest political win of the year. Coming to yeah, me, I'm back I, to feel, you again. I feel like the students sitting in the front row here. <laughs> oh, I'll just um, switch it up. Then. Okay, yeah. uh, I gave that to the NDP, the uh, federal NDP, for, the yeah. federal NDP for two reasons: the anti-scab legislation, which was uh, a pipe dream of not just the NDP but the Bloc Québécois for decades, yeah. mm. but also an expansion of Medicare into dental care. Those were two kind of dream things that the NDP kept talking about, <clears throat> and they never happened. I'm not passing judgment on whether they're good or yeah, bad, yeah. but they are big wins for, the for a fourth place party in the House of Commons. Althea. Daniel Smith. Yep. Uh, I think if you had asked us 18 months ago, uh, 
probably, I think maybe you may have asked us 18 <laughs> months ago, and we all said, well, the polls were suggesting Rachel Notley was going to win. But it's not just that she won and that she won a majority, but that she has changed the national conversation. And I'm not sure that we would be having the discussions the way we are discussing them were it not for her leadership. It has affected, obviously, Premier Mo's um, response, but I think it is also changing the consensus federally over certain things. And I think that that is going to change the conversation next year. You also chose a province. Yeah, the Manitoba NDP winning. Uh, um, not a huge surprise. The Conservative government there had long overstayed its welcome. Uh, but, you know, to have our first, uh, first Nations Premier of a province in the history of the country uh, is pretty remarkable. He himself is a remarkable life story. Uh, when you consider the troubles he had as a young man, uh, and the maturity he is now showing and the uh, leadership he's showing, uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, um, breakthrough for the country. And I think it's something, you know, we all dwell a lot on the negative news. That's a pretty positive, good news story. Okay, biggest political surprise of the year. Althea, you start us off on that one. The takedown of David Johnston. Um, so the conservatives used to trumpet their appointment of Mr. Johnston as governor general as like, see, all the liberals screw up governor general appointments, but we've got the best one. And he's the best Canadian you could have. He's the greatest Canadian icon and on and on. And I'm talking like the Harper conservatives yeah. used to talk about David Johnston that way. And to see them basically ruin this man's reputation, because I think they had some legitimate arguments to make about the government's handling over foreign interference yeah. and questions to raise. But that, to me, was the... I would not have anticipated that this time yeah. last year. And he probably didn't either. Um, Chantal. Um, the Justin Trudeau's carbon tax carve-out. Uh, this is a, a prime minister who fought three election campaigns, but especially the last two, on carbon pricing, went to the Supreme Court to defend the, the right of the federal government to do this. And then in, in a really neglectful approach, said, oh, gee, people, I'm going to advance the fight against climate change by go doing a carve out for people who, do, who heat their homes with oil. Well, um, he must have known that it would take, especially since he had as a backdrop his Atlantic MPs, he must have known it would take two seconds to connect Atlantic Canada, oil eating, and the sudden need for a carve out. And I thought it was the most back of the envelope move uh, that no one saw coming uh, from this government this year. And there were many others, but that one <laughs> just took that the prize. That was the best one, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, the sudden widening of the gap between the Conservatives and the Liberals starting in June of this year. I mean, before then, they'd been locked in this sort of thing where one party was ahead yeah. by two or three points, yeah. but it was always pretty tight. And a lot of us were saying, you know, okay, you know, probably ever, you know, the people are discontented with the government, but they don't seem willing to place their support with the Conservatives. Well, bang, suddenly they went to a 14, 15, and even, I think, 18 or 19 point gap at its peak. Uh, we'll see whether that has started to reverse itself a little bit. Um, it doesn't seem to be connected to that advertising campaign to make, make them look no. touchy-feely. That was later. Or to Justin Trudeau's... Um, um, gaff of saying, you know, housing isn't a federal responsibility. It may be connected to that last interest rate hike mm -hmm. uh, that was brought in, I guess it was in June. But for whatever reason, uh, um, um, it was a pretty pronounced gap by the end of the summer. Okay, we're going to do uh, who impressed you most with their leadership, but I'm going to do most and least in the same answer. I have a TBD for your least, so maybe <laughs> I hope you've come up with an answer. I'm going to start with you. So sure. impressed you most and least. Uh, impressed me most is Pierre Poilievre. Uh, I loathe in some ways to say it, but uh, you know, you, you, when you get to 42% in the polls, uh, you got to be doing something right. And he's clearly a very effective communicator. He was clearly right to get on top of the housing and affordability issue and really hammer that when the government was quite yeah. uh, complacent on it. Yeah. Uh, least impressive, Pierre Poilievre. <laughs> And this is the that thing. That might be cheating here. No, but this is the thing. Just when they're riding high, yeah. he starts, you know, playing to that same gallery that he likes to play to that is not Mr. and Mrs. Canada, that is uh, playing to the fringes and, and picking fights and all the things that it, it seems like it's just in him. He can't yeah. resist. And lo and behold, we're starting to see maybe some, some degree of pushback on, on those, uh, that polling success. Chantal, least, uh, least, most and least. 
Uh, most I went uh, with, I thought, because we don't get impressed by politicians. No, we we watch hard. them, yeah, we're yeah. interested in them, yeah. but uh, they, they, to be impressed is kind of a weird approach. So I went with someone who isn't on the scene anymore, Aaron O'Toole, who I thought uh, gave one of the best speeches mm -hmm. this year, his farewell speech, where he cautioned his colleagues uh, on the way out uh, about the fact that debate was being lost to the use of the House of Commons as a, a, a prop to, for social media purposes yes. Yes. and the dangers of that. Uh, it was almost as if he was describing what you should do or shouldn't do to a successor who promptly decided to do exactly what, is, yep. uh, what Mr. O'Toole was uh, cautioning against. But I still believe that speech will endure much longer than most of the speeches yeah. we heard this year. Um, least I was tempted to talk about your CBC president, but I, over a week has elapsed since then, and I will go with Pierre Poiliev for a very uh, strange reason. He won the fall. Andrew is right. But, and then he went into this, we're going to keep the house sitting till Christmas. Yeah. And to me, over the past two weeks, he has looked like the guy who goes to the casino, is having a great night. <laughs> but will not leave the table until he's lost his shirt. <laughs> uh, and I think if, you're, if you don't know when to call a win a win and yeah. take your, yeah. your winnings home, yeah. you have a problem. Okay, Althea. I think a lot of the conservative backbench might agree with uh, some <laughs> of your assessments. Um, so I said impress me the most with their leadership, the Liberal Caucus. For the reasons that Chantal outlined as a surprise, um, I don't know if it's because of Justin Trudeau's declining numbers and the Liberals' disastrous summer, um, but the backbench has started to flex its muscle in a way that was promised back in 2015 mm -hmm. that never really materialized mm -hmm. but for a handful of maverick MPs. Amazing and, and what <laughs> fear of losing your seat. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. At, at least? Quickly. I went with François Legault. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. Because it has been... Uh, a very impressive decline. He does not seem to have his pulse on yep. Quebecers' desire anymore, and the government seems to be really struggling, making terrible decisions, whether it's health care, whether it's increasing uh, the salary of um, members of the National Assembly. People are not on site anymore, and we have this huge strike. I don't know by the time this airs if the strike will have been resolved, but um, he doesn't have the pulse on Quebecers' mood anymore. Okay. So we're off to a good start. We're going to leave it there for this round. We'll be back with more at issue. Up next, we'll look ahead to 2024 and the biggest political challenges. From the outcome of the U.S. presidential election to the Conservative Party's momentum and Justin Trudeau's own political future, a lot can shape the next year in Canadian politics. So what do you need to watch for in 2024? What are the biggest political challenges? Okay, let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea all here with me in person for another round of our year ender. This is not crystal ball. That's not what I, because I know you all hate that, so that's not what you have to do here. But just uh, based on what we know, the kinds of things that we're going to watch for uh, in 2024. So let's start with the political leader or MP to watch for next year. Uh, it's a no-brainer that we need to watch Justin Trudeau, even if he says every uh, second minute that he's staying on. Uh, at some point in the calendar, if he's still there, uh, he will be staying. Yes. But he still has uh, time to change his mind. I don't know if he will, but one way or another, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yep. Andrew. Uh, his uh, partner in crime, <laughs> if you will, uh, Jagmeet Singh. Uh, who at some point uh, may or may not make a decision about whether he wants to continue with this supposedly ironclad agreement, which was always going to be hostage to, to political expedience. Sure. Um, if, the, if the Liberals stay where they are or go lower in the polls, he'll be sorely tempted to uh, pull the ripcord. Pierre Poiliev. Look at you guys, just all the three leaders there. <laughs> well, I mean, for the reasons I think Andrew outlined, is he going to rise to the occasion and be that prime minister in waiting, or is he going to play to the instincts, which are frat boy, uh, very hyper partisan? Um, I think that there has been a reality check uh, in December, November, and we'll see whether or not changes happen in the new year. And, and of those people that we just talked about, who has the most to lose? Oh, well, uh, well Pierre Poiliev, because he, he is way up uh, in the polls, it's going to be really hard for 
uh, Pierre Poilievre to sustain that lead for maybe 18 months yeah. uh, and and to do so in a way that um, you know that one of the things that I think conservatives should pay attention to is that Mr. Poilievre is making enemies every second day. He's made more enemies in the Senate than he needs to. He's made more enemies of the other opposition party than he needed. He's making enemies of mayors of Canada's larger cities. But what if he fails? What if he wins but fails to deliver a majority? Mm. Who will he be mm -hmm. talking to? And he's, he's burning more bridges mm. than he's building. I remember our old colleague Bruce Anderson's yes. line on election night 2015. He said, I don't think the liberals would have won it if they hadn't started in third. One of the things that Justin Trudeau, obviously, and any liberal leader has to guard against is looking arrogant, looking full of themselves. Uh, um, so if he'd come into that ahead, he might yeah. have really been in trouble. Yeah. Coming from behind, looking like the underdog, maybe this is the scenario that liberals are dreaming of in this case, yeah. but, but it can't be ruled out. Yeah, I do know people that have said to conservatives, stop measuring for courage. Oh, yeah. It's not time yet. Okay, biggest political challenge for 2024, Althea. Can the liberals turn the tide? Basically the flip side of that question. Um, I don't know if they can. Does it mean a new leader? If it doesn't mean a new leader, what, what has to yeah. change? Yeah. Andrew. Uh, the U.S. election in November, um, it's going to be a chaotic year. Uh, well, all kinds of things nobody can predict, but, <laughs> yeah. but more so, I think, than any election I can think of. If Donald Trump gets in, it's very clear that he's going to use that uh, office to seek retribution on his enemies, to try to exempt himself from the rule of law in terms of his own criminal charges, uh, uh, stack the whole government with his loyalists, uh, have the craziest people in MAGA around him, um, there is real potential for a breakdown in political order in the United States, including well, political violence. Yeah, and, and potentially the world in yeah. terms of geopolitical well, stability, right. right? And we're, you're already <laughs> seeing a breakdown of the Pax Americana. Our adversaries, adversaries of the democratic West, are already um, you know, making their moves, uh, even now. Mm -hmm. uh, but imagine if they see America as divided and consumed as they are then, and the implications for Canada are profound. Yeah. Well, even the impact on politics in Canada. Is yes. but, yeah. uh, and I'll go with that, too, because it, uh, <laughs> few events could impact the dynamics, the political dynamics in this country from outside as much as the yeah. American election. And I can't tell you how it would impact. But it would change the conversation. I also believe that the outcome of that election could have more consequences on our governance, regardless of who wins the next federal election, than just about anything that will happen between now and election night. I think if uh, uh, Trump comes back to the White House, the oxygen will be sucked out of the room of any Canadian government, conservative or liberal, just trying to figure out what happens when. I don't know where we would stand on Ukraine. Uh, considering what's happening next door. Uh, what would a, an administration that has no interest in the rule of law do uh, to Canadians who are similarly inclined? Go down the list. But the first Trump administration basically meant that the Trudeau government suddenly set its agenda aside to deal with Trump. Well, this is Trump 2.0 is nothing like the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated and much more risky for any federal government. And I am not sure that either party um, would be able to sustain a partisan stance in the face of that. OK, well, we're going to leave it on that note, <laughs> I'm afraid. But thank you all for your smart thoughts. And, and happy holidays to all of you. Thank you for being here. And I'll see you back here next week for our last panel of the year, where we will take some of your questions. Now I'll send things back to the National. Thanks, Rosie. Coming up, one of our favorite moments of the year. So far, we've had no guests uh, take us up on our offer yet. An Ontario hotel with a very Canadian valet service. Next. As we wrap up this year, we're counting down our 12 most loved moments of 2023. Tonight at number 10, an Ontario hotel with a unique version of valet parking. So far, we've had no guests uh, take us up on our offer yet. 
So when you're when you're driving uh, along Highway 11 and you uh, you decide to uh, look for a hotel room, you can pull into the Quality Inn parking lot, and you can uh, you'll see on our sign it says "Ask about our valet parking." Uh, we do tell clients uh, it's use at your own risk. This is our third year doing it. So the first one was um, during the pandemic. Our second year, we uh, we decided to go maybe a little bit uh, bigger. We put a 32 foot full size 32 foot RV in the thing. And then this year we decided to go instead of going long, we decided to go a little wider and uh, we offered our uh, our four vehicle uh, valet. Hey, you can't park there. The reaction to this has been there. fantastic. Apparently, yeah, for some reason, a lot of people think this is real. A lot of people uh, can't believe and you know, are questioning whether our insurance would cover this as long as, you know, it makes people laugh and it, and it gets a chuckle uh, and people get a chuckle out of it driving by. That was kind of our main uh, main reason. Definitely a chuckle or two. A lot of those vehicles, by the way, were donated. The owner said he did it just to enjoy seeing people's reactions. But since our moment back in January, the hotel has changed ownership. So it remains to be seen if this tradition will carry on this winter. Hopefully they will once there is enough snow, that is. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime, or you can watch a free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Take care.